Hey, it told me we were recording this time. All right, nothing like a Zoom update, right? Well, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our coaching session. I am your host, Will Cooper. So thanks for tolerating all the uh, Red Bull this morning. And I hope it's not too much, but uh, we're gonna talk about communication today. And who doesn't need to communicate better, right? Uh, all right, did you read my email? Did anyone laugh? Okay, you didn't read the email. You read it, Joe, thanks. Angie, okay, yeah, some of you are like, oh yeah, it's, yeah. Anyone laugh that you need to communicate better with your spouse? <laughs> still laughing on the inside. There's still <laughs> so much laughter here on the inside. All right, well, today, today is uh, about communication. So uh, let's jump right into it. Page 122, get ready to take some notes. Uh, right off the bat, we're talking about how we say things uh, and uh, uh, what we say, and it matters. Remember what Alan Dalton said about a listing agent versus a marketing agent? That was a very simple example of, you know, what we say matters and how we say it. So uh, very true. Uh, take a look and highlight a few of the things here. Uh, matter of fact, let me share screen. And uh, we'll follow along here. Paragraph one. Um, having issues. <laughs> Why am I having issues? Are you kidding me? I've done this a million times. Um, huh? Yeah, it's. Is it sharing, you guys? It's saying it's waiting for you to share. Did you hit that little share button once it comes uh, up? Yeah, about five times. So here, I shared here it again. It's not, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not doing it. So, okay, fine. Okay. I'll pull it up, Will. Okay, thank you so much. Now, are you seeing it? No? Yes? Yeah. You are seeing yeah, communication? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, sir. Well, that, that's weird. Okay, well, um, okay, we'll pick up where we left off here. So uh, what I would highlight here is uh, stop to consider that, um, that what we're trying to do here is, uh, this is a better way of saying sales is communication. So sales is really communication. Uh, I think it's a better way to say it, you know, speaking of, you know, what we say, how we say it. I'd rather talk about being a better communicator than a better salesperson any day. I'm not blind to the fact that there's a process of communication through a sales process, quote unquote, but I'd rather not be uh, labeled as a salesperson for all, all of the obvious reasons. Salespeople are off, often self-serving um, and, and kind of miss the heart of, uh, of the matter. So uh, I would highlight, we're talking about communication here. And so we're improving this. Um, this is a skill set that translates across everything we do, okay? Notice uh, that when we talk about communication, highlight this, we've got verbal, of course, but uh, in the language and the words we use, but we also have nonverbal elements of communication, such as posture, facial expressions, uh, highlight the, you know, the tone of my voice. It even, even includes the clothing I'm, I'm wearing, you, you know, my eye, my eye contact, the gestures I make with my hands or the way I move my head or what have you, okay? All of this is a way that we communicate. Uh, I did look this up. I thought it was higher than uh, 55%, but uh, according to uh, a university study, nonverbal expressions account for 55% of human communication. So uh, it really is um, uh, not just what the words we say and you know what we say, but it's, it's, it's how we say it, okay? Um, the, the reason I think that's important is because we don't want to be scripted. We don't want to be robotic. If you're scripted and robotic, you, you sound unsincere. Uh, and this is the problem with salespeople versus a communicator. Okay. So one of the affirmations is today is I want to be a better communicator and, and, and not a salesperson. Okay. So um, all of this is meant to communicate trust. If you want to highlight that, I think that's what we're after here. And trust doesn't come easy. I raised four daughters <laughs> when, when their boyfriends said, trust me, uh, you, you know, we had to have a discussion about that. <laughs> okay. Trust comes over time. 
you, you know, you got to go through some battles first. So they didn't just automatically win trust. Okay. But that's, that's what we're kind of after. Okay. So let's, let's dive into something that I think is really important. And I'm, I'm going to guys, I'm leveraging. Uh, can you also see what I'm holding up? You can. Okay. Thanks, Wendy playing along. So this is a very, uh, uh, you know, staple popular book, how to win friends, influence people, Dale Carnegie. If you don't already have it, get, get a copy. Uh, again, a staple of something you'd have in your library. How many have already read it or, or know of the book? Just yeah, Travis, uh, Bob, Kay, Michael, good, and Norm, good. Okay, uh, great book. Uh, it's a great thing to kind of keep rehearsing. So one of the principles is to not be argumentative. Uh, have you ever noticed a salesperson never wins an argument? I mean, never. You never win an argument. Uh, so the challenge is, what are you going to do when someone says something that might be inaccurate? You know, how are you going to handle that uh, in a presentation, a buyer, seller? They're going to say something that may not be factually true, uh, statistically, you know, confirmed, uh, or just flat out, just just not the best or most accurate statement. Okay, so what do we do with that? Um, I think of a tennis racket is is my if I could actually change out this icon right here, I'd put a tennis racket, two tennis rackets, because to have an argument, you have to have two tennis rackets. It means you have to volley back. So. This is why I thought it might be helpful for spouses and other relationships. You can't argue unless you volley back. If you just don't volley back, you don't argue. You ever notice that? Like this argument's done. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's over. So, um, okay. I was trying to think of a story if I should tell you or not, but it might, it might make, make, make another company look bad. So <laughs> I'll stay away from that. Uh, but, you know, you just don't volley. Have you ever heard anyone say, like, I'm just going to play devil's advocate? You ever heard anyone say that? So I'll tell you what, good communicator, throw that one out the window, will you? That, that's a horrible, <laughs> it's a horrible thing to really, if you think about it literally, would you really want to be the advocate of the devil? <laughs> I mean, would you really want to do that? Uh, but what people are doing is they're trying to say, I, please, uh, please forgive me for what I'm about to do that might offend you. It was probably going to offend you. Y you know, it's like, I'm about to hit you. So, you know, buckle up. <laughs> right. So um, we, I think there's a better way to, to express a, like the other side of the coin, so to speak, y y you know, is probably a better way to say that I want to be devil's advocate. Okay. So I, look, my first tip is to get rid of that statement. The other one that's like it is like when someone says, well, I don't want to be negative, you know, and then guess what they go and do. What, what do they do? When someone says, I don't want to be negative, what do they do immediately after that? <laughs> They're negative, right, Kira? <laughs> yeah. So again, I think we should probably watch how we say these things, throw those things out. It's horrible in buyer presentations, seller presentations. Uh, throw the uh, devil's advocate out and I don't want to be negative. Okay. Throw that out. Now, again, the challenge is how are you truthful and, uh, and, and uh, you know, correct things that are wrong. And I think that's really, really important. So here's the example. Go to the next page here. Here's the example that played out in a coaching session. So let me tell you what was going on. Uh, we were presenting scripts this, this day. Okay. And we were, we were kind of like going over the structure of scripts. And uh, after we'd gone through it about 20 minutes, uh, an agent who was clearly a little agitated um, ra raised her hand and said something like, I don't want to say, she, she was responding to one of the objections. She goes, I wouldn't say that to a client at all. So it was pretty bold. You, you know, like I would never say that, she said, re referring to one of the scripts. I think it sounds too much like a cold salesperson. Okay, now before I could respond, which is interesting because um, you just heard me say we want to we don't want to be a salesperson, right? You just heard me say don't be scripted. It's like like don't over memorize things because you'll lose your authenticity. Okay, everybody with me on that? Like don't be careful of memorizing scripts because you lose your authenticity. So, but before I could respond, an agent in the class began to justify why the script 
was a good way to respond. In other words, she picked up the tennis racket. <laughs> right? You guys, you with me, guys? Mike, is this making any sense? It is? Okay. <laughs> so keep rolling, Will. Keep rolling. Okay, so she picks up the tennis racket and she volleys back. And she goes like, no, they're, you know, they're they're great scripts. And she went point by point by point by point. Now, what do you think happened in that class? Anyone? I mean, what do you what do you think happened? Go ahead, talk about the great agent fight of 2019. <laughs> yeah. Two so, ambulances, fire department, disaster cleanup. It was brutal. <laughs> yeah, it, it was mass hysteria. Oh, yeah, very healthy debate. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish I could say that, uh, Cecilia, but it, it really wasn't. It was, uh, yeah, it, it turned out like I have to win. Um, and, and both person, you know, they're in, they're in their peer group. Okay. So it was really, really tense. And I watched this play out. So let me continue on here. And I wondered, am I even getting through to anyone? You know, I, I really was like, wow, I, I should probably just uh, stop, you know, whatever pattern I thought I was teaching, I was failing. Because uh, they missed the big picture. Okay, so the agent's concern who said I wouldn't do this was very valid. It was extremely valid. So just like your seller or your buyer will have a very valid concern. So will you write down here or actually just highlight this right here. Never minimize a client's concern. Frankly, don't memorize anyone's concern. You, you know, like raising teenagers. So they said something, see something that matters to a teenager, don't minimize it. I, I know that a lot of things like, I know I'm making an extreme example here, but if something is like ridiculously immature, but it matters to someone, don't minimize it. Okay. So that's the skill set. Does that happen with buyers and sellers? Absolutely. They're going to say things and you're going to think, wow, that's not really that big of a deal, uh, but don't minimize it. Okay. Uh, because the message we send is we don't get it. We don't understand, you, you know, isn't that the kind of the classic teenager movie? You know, the teenager says, you know, my parents don't understand. <laughs> uh, it is, it's this classic plot, you know, you know, will the parents ever really get the teenager? Uh, you know, and this plays out in, in presentations, okay? So we want to resist these knee-jerk reactions and we want to listen, okay? So, the next principle here is instead of minimizing a client's concern, we advance it. Would you highlight that? Advance it. Think about advancing it maybe on a football field or something similar to that, where we take the concern and we actually magnify it. In other words, we dig into it even deeper. So if they were concerned about a key box on a house and safety, you don't say, oh my gosh, yeah, that's ridic you know, ridiculous. We never have a problem, you know. You advance it. You say, you know, we're really concerned about safety. We want to know who's in the home. Uh, we we want to vet each buyer. Ideally, we'd love to be present when possible, not only answer questions about the property to make sure that we're there to protect your belongings. See, now that's somebody who gets it, right? But But how tempting is it to just say, that's ridiculous. You know, there's no reason why someone can't just show the house. Are, are you guys with me? So that's just one example and we want to advance it so this is really looking at it from their point of view and then we show them that we get it so we take it further to show them that we understand okay if you don't understand then ask questions like if you're unclear about what the concern is we come back and say could you clarify that for me yes it does validate yeah um the proper response should be one where we agree with the point they're making uh, instead of, you know, minimizing it. Okay. Now, what if we, uh, what if we challenge to agree with something that is factually wrong, right? Isn't that hard to do? What if someone says something that's factually wrong? Um, so what we do is we go back to remember the reason and the why. Um, would you write in right here in this margin here? This is what I have in my notes. Um, always start from a place of agreement begin so that often is the reason i have that bolded here so we can agree with the reason 
We can all, so they might be factually wrong about a detail, but what they want and what we want is often the same. Okay. So start from a place of agreement and then work from there. Okay. Do you see the, you see the difference then, then volleying back and saying, no, you know, the scripts were great, right? No, the scripts were not authentic. What another agent say, no, they were, they were great. Okay. Why not just build from a place of agreement? Why not start that conversation with, you know, that's a really good point. The last thing in the world we want to do is be robotic and not be authentic. Because if we're not authentic, how do we build trust? And so maybe what we do is we take the good things of the scripts and we personalize them. And then we only rememorize a pattern. Now, all of a sudden, heads start nodding, right? It's, instead of it being a, 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 an adversarial volley over the net, you actually jump on the other side of the net with the same person. It's impossible to argue with someone who sees the world the same way you do, right? And we can always agree on the reason and the why. Um, we also make a note here that this goes back to the core uh, benefits. So the reason why is core benefits like highest possible net, highest possible sales price, least amount of time, and, and least amount of legal risk. That's benefit. So that's the reason. That's why we're here. Okay. All right. Is this helpful? Okay. Kelly, is this helpful? <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Um, the other paragraph here is that we have to be honest with people. We have to love them enough to tell them the truth, but be careful how you do it. Like, you know, um, I, one of the comedians said, you, you know, like you would never tell your loved one, well, boy, your hair looks hideous today. <laughs> I mean, you know, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> um, so just because it's true, okay, doesn't always mean you have to say it. And uh, I think uh, this, this, because if you really love someone, it, it's, it's how you're, you know, how you're handling that relationship, you know? Uh, one of my mentors also said that relationships are like precious silverware. If you want it to last, you treat it differently and you treat it carefully. So uh, remember, uh, you know, the humanity of all of this. And I, I've always said lead with heart. And I, I think that's what this is about here. So we have to balance this. I mean, you love them enough to tell them the truth. In other words, if there's bad news about the deal, we tell them the truth. But how we go about doing it, we can be heartfelt and understanding. And if they blow up, uh, you know, yesterday I heard of, of an agent who kind of lost their cool. And um, I'd like to say it was another agent from another company, but it wasn't. It was one of our own. And they lost their cool. And, uh, you know, so what are you going to do? Minimize their concern? No. Are you going to listen? Yes. Are you going to advance their concern? Yes. Are you going to work from a place of agreement? Yes. Are you going to be heartfelt? Of course. Are we going to remember the reason we're together? Yes. So, so all of that is the better way to communicate. What's the, the wrong way to do that is to minimize the concern and say, gosh, what's your problem? You know, and criticize. Never works. Let me, um, I'm afraid to stop sharing, but, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a sec because, you know, who knows if that will work again. But um, Dale Carnegie, chapter one. <laughs> uh, chapter one, you, you know, what does that say that's highlighted? If you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. <laughs> and so often we, we do that. Um, there was a study in here that they referred to. Uh, here, let me, let me just read it really quick. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds the person's previous uh, precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. There's a world-famous uh, psychologist proved that through his experiment that an animal reward for good behavior will learn much more rapidly 
and retain it uh, learns far more effectively than the animal who's punished for bad behavior. Okay. So as such, as we thirst for approval, we dread condemnation. Um, any thoughts on that? Have you noticed that? Yes. Uh, what's Jill saying here? Okay, we forget sometimes that a client is always right, <laughs> even if they are wrong, right? Yeah, and so we have to delicately and uh, heartfeltly uh, correct, but correct it in a way that also builds on a place of agreement. See, that's why I always go back to what we all want. Y you know, like if we're if we're having this thing about safety of the house, I can get on board with that. You know, do I have to be present at every showings? Maybe, maybe that is what we need to do. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I just ask the question, what would you prefer instead of being argumentative? So jump on that side of, of the court and, and it's hard to argue. You have to paint a picture to help them come to their own conclusion without coming right out and saying they were wrong. Exactly right. You know how you come to your, they come to their own conclusion? You ask questions instead of make statements. Think about that, you know, like if you're making a statement, you can be argumentative, but if you're asking a question, then they can answer it, right? So that will take away uh, the gasoline that can sometimes build in contentious, uh, you know, fire potential uh, conversations that it can be heavy, okay? Um, okay, is this helpful? Do you, do you like this? We haven't, we haven't, this is brand new material, right? We've not really talked about this in any coaching class uh, up to this moment. So let's go back and talk about trading our buts and uh, howevers <laughs> for ands, okay? Have you ever noticed when someone's talking to you, they might say, well, but, what, what, the word but, what does that do when you say it? Like if you say something like, you know, um, that sometimes works, but what did you just do? <laughs> Mike, I'm not racist, but okay. If you're said I'm not racist, but you just said you're a racist, right? So whatever the thing is, you know, like open houses, uh, you know, they're, they're not effective, but so are they effective? I mean, what's the next part of this? Uh, what I've tried to remember is highlight this on that first paragraph there. It says, the word but deletes the sentence in front of it. So whoops, maybe we don't want to delete it. Maybe a better way to say is by contrast. But if you say but, you deleted it. You know, she's a great agent, but. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, it's like buckle up. Again, it's kind of like the devil's advocate. You know, I don't want to be negative. Or I don't, I'll be the devil's advocate. Uh-oh, here we go. You know, um, maybe there's a better way to communicate. So trade your buts and howevers, because however is just a really nice but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I said that. Yes, a however is a really nice but. Okay, but it's still a but. So we don't want to say that. Uh, we want to say ands. So you want to build, see, that's building upon something. So when you say and, you add to it. That's a lot better. Okay. So I think open houses are a really good way to find buyers, but I don't have the time to hold them. So they must not be worth it. Translations, open houses are not worth the time because of the word, but how about this? In addition, the word, however, minimize the sentence in front of it. Uh, I see your point. It's not what I think. My perspective is more accurate when you say, however right? Again, you're minimizing it. So when you say, however, you've minimized the person's concern. I'm concerned about um, what the inspection might show on this property. You know, I'm real. it's an older property. It's, it's, you know, it could have a lot of problems. So what are you saying? So how are you going to handle that? If you say, and, and add to it. So, and I, that's important. It's important that we have a thorough inspection. And, you know, we may consider roof inspection specifically. We also may consider specifically an electrical inspection and, and, and we probably should have, maybe we should have the well water tested. So see, that's advancing it.
But if you took it and said, well, look, the inspection will show this and you minimize it, but the inspection will show it, you know, then, then you just you just took their concern and, and you said to them, you don't understand. Right. So a horrible way to communicate. It doesn't it doesn't show uh, that we care about their perspective. OK. Um, all right. Let's see. Let's go. Uh, any any questions or comments? I'm about to turn the page to 124. But any uh, any comments or you guys want to weigh in here? Yeah, I'll uh, chime Mike. in a little bit. Yeah, hit me, um, Mike. So the the one thing that um, that we've we've said a lot here, but I've heard phrased slightly different, is that um, and and by the way, this is I've I've used this for a very long time as a broker. And had a lot of angry people sitting at my desk and i've yet to have someone walk out feeling the same way that they walked in and it's it's literally from using all these techniques and at first it does feel labored and it does feel like you're using a technique on them but when you realize why you're doing it it's very meaningful and the the first thing that all all of these are connected in a way that are um the bottom line is you have to acknowledge an emotion to the to a statement, right? So if we use the um, the inspection analysis, right? Well, I need to do a, a more thorough inspection than the one that you're proposing. There is an emotion behind that that needs to be acknowledged, and once you acknowledge that emotion, you will understand why they're feeling it and why it's valid to them. Um, so if anybody's ever talking to you and, and throwing something that you need to uh, it, it's really what Will's saying is advancing the idea. Like, you know what? Your concern is valid. You, there's a lot of stuff that could go wrong here. And that's very concerning. Like, I could see why you would be worried about that situation. Uh, acknowledging someone else's emotion is huge. And it goes a really long way um, when you communicate with somebody or you have to overcome conflict or you have to uh, overcome some type of adversarial position. So acknowledging emotion that someone else is feeling is is massive and it and it works wonders. It's kind of like a it's like a life hack that I didn't know because I probably wasn't mature enough. Anyway. Good point. Hey Mike, uh let's have a dialogue. I was just thinking about this. I want you to be pretty upset right now. And I want you to uh I want you to blame me, the buyer's agent, for uh the fact that you missed the house that you didn't get the you didn't win the bid okay so we just i'm the buyer and i'm mad you're you're the buyer you're mad you didn't your your offer was not accepted and i just gave you the bad news okay okay so go ahead you know will uh this is the fifth offer that we have missed out on and i feel like there's i feel like we're not competing well and i i I don't know who else to turn to to solve this problem. I'm not really happy with the outcome. I, Mike, I'm heartbroken that we didn't. Uh, that, that I know you guys love that house, and nobody is. Uh, why are you guys laughing? Why is Angie and Kim laughing? I'm I'm really heartbroken. I'm dying. I'm mad, Angie. By the way, I'm mad, and he's heartbroken, <laughs> and you're laughing. This is. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, no, I, uh, I, I think, I think what you have to do, guys, is everything we just talked about. You have to be understanding, and also I have to remove myself from the emotional connection to the deal. Like what I wanted you to really say, because I heard this, I heard this last week. A very, very good agent was accused of being the reason and the problem the offer was not accepted, and the buyer was saying, "Look, I want a different, you know, I, I think I need a different agent." And I'm like, wow, knowing this agent like I do, I thought that's ridiculous. You know, she has, she is not the reason why they didn't win the bid, you know? So, um, and they, I just wanted you to come out and basically just be gasoline, you know, and just say, Will, we need a new agent. You're the reason why we're not, we're not winning these. I talked to a friend of mine and my friend said that, you know, they won the bid and it's, you're the problem. Okay, so I, I guess I've turned the knob all the way up. I'm, they're attacking you, the agent. This is the hardest thing to deal with. 
when someone's attacking you, okay? And, and look, if you don't love them, you're in trouble. I'll just tell you that right now. If, if you don't love the, the client unconditionally and you, just, and you don't want what's best for them, you're in trouble. Because if you do love them, then whatever they say, you can understand. You're going to be empathetic. And you're, you're, you can even say things, you know, I'm really sorry it didn't work out. I mean, perhaps we should look at other techniques and strategies. You know, I, I mean, it's a tough market right now. I, I'm heartbroken to think that you would, you, you would think that I'm the reason. I mean, you're going to have to be truthful, but you cannot minimize it. You cannot volley back. You cannot say, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. <laughs> Those are dead ends. It doesn't work. You'll never win. You know, I can see that you're upset. I'm upset too. I, I really wanted that house for you guys. Um, now, look, my, my kids didn't get mad at me, but they were sad. We wrote four offers back in the fall. Four offers. And that, you guys... When your daughter who holds you on a pedestal, who thinks you're the best thing ever in real estate, okay, and I have to tell her three times that she didn't get the deal, she just doesn't understand how dad didn't get the house for her. You don't think that killed me? It killed me. I couldn't believe I was having to tell her this. You know, they got so attached. Same principles though, I understand sweetheart, you know, but first of all, she knows I love her and I do, and she knows that and she loves me. And so already we're on, we're on a pretty solid foundation, right? But if you don't, if you're only caring about transaction, uh, I've, unfortunately I've heard of agents who have volleyed back with a fireball and said, well, go get another agent then, you know, and I mean, said things that are not appropriate. It never works, by the way. You're not going to tell, you're not going to give someone a piece of your mind and then they're going to say, oh, God, thank you so much. I didn't see it that way. Wow, I was completely wrong. Okay, never happened. <laughs> not not going to ever happen. You, you know, you're not going to railroad someone and they'll go, thank you for running me over. I really appreciate that. You know, not, not going to happen. So um, I think all these things matter. Um, and I, and I hope that that, I hope that that helps. I know things can get a little stressful out there. So any other tips before we go into trust and uh, the next exercise on page 124, any other comments? Well, I got a little two cents here. I okay. I'm, uh, finished a book called Mental Immunity by a guy named Andy Norman. And the whole concept of mental immunity is that we as humans get really attached to our ideas and our ideology. <clears throat> and so we're entering this communication thinking, I, in our very, you know, our biases are, I'm the one that's a better communicator. So you're already walking into most communication sessions thinking you're the right one and they're wrong. Let me use my technique because you're an emotional crazy person. So I'm going to make sure that you understand that my ideas are correct by keeping my tone and by doing all these other things. And the interesting thing about uh, the book is that it basically goes through and it says, if you are married to your ideas, like, and, and unable to accept new information, uh, as you pointed out earlier, saying, let's address the emotion of the situation. Let's address the concern for what it is. You're already setting off in a, a negative situation because you're pitting yourself against the other person. So even if your intentions are good, let me allow you, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you why having the key box is so important. I'm right. So even though you're addressing and saying, I know that's a concern, I'm gonna address that concern. But by the way, I'm right this whole time because I'm correct and you're not. So I'm going to use these techniques. They'll backfire on you every time. And so just like you said, well, if you're not approaching the situation, being willing to take your own ideas and your own ideologies, accept new information and learn and change your behaviors based on the new information you're getting, you're yeah. never going to get through a uh, stalemate like this because yeah. you've already walked into a situation pitting yourself against someone where you think you already have the upper hand. I'm correct. My ideas are correct. I've been doing real estate for 25 years. Anything you're going to throw at me, I'm already right. Yeah. So no matter what it is that you're dealing with, that's because you're a weaker person than I am. So please allow me to use these conversation yeah. techniques to calm you down while I can give you the information and beat you over the head with logic until you submit to what I already know is true. Yeah. 
yeah. and that, and that you, it's, it's a very difficult thing to self-reflect and, and think to yourself, what are the ideas and ideologies that I'm, I will not accept new information on, right? And that's yeah. a challenge. It's a very, very big, big challenge. Um, write this down, guys. I'm going to take what Joe said. It's a little, and kind of a little bit of what Mike said too. Um, you, you know, call them life hacks or whatever. I don't, I don't know even where I learned this. But Joe just said something, and then as he's talking, and as Mike was talking, I wanted to say something like this. I like how you think. Write that down. It's a great way to praise someone, reward someone for the comments they make and the way they're going about it. You know, I've had, I've instructed thousands, thousands and thousands of agents. I ask a question in class, what do you do with the, with the student who gets it wrong? What if, what if I asked a question and they got it wrong? You know what I've often said? You know, I would say, you know what? Um, I'd say Tyler is, you can tell Tyler is street smart. See, that's a compliment. I can even find a compliment when the answer is wrong. So you say things like, I like how you think. You said that very well. I could say, you know, well said. I'd say, very well said, Mike. Very well said, Joe. So, you know, those are little deposits that say, I agree with you. It's being agreeable. I see the world from your point of view. Instead of my way, your way, which Joe was just saying, right? So inject those in your conversations. I say, that's very well said. You make a really good point is another way to say that. You know, I think that's another great, another great perspective, you know? And if it's really, you know, I like questions after that, you, you know? Do you think not having a key box might restrict? I, I'd say something like this. I'd say, I think the question is whether or not not having the key box on the house will restrict our showings where it would have a negative impact on uh, you know, what we're trying to achieve. See, that's a question that also reminds us what we're after. Okay. So that's a better way to communicate. Um, yeah, well, so on, the, on the book, so he's a trained, he's trained as a scientist. And his whole point is, as a scientist, your, all your ideas, even your, your pet ideas, your, your children, the ones that you work the hardest for, in, in the scientific world, all your ideas are subject to intense scrutiny. And, and what he's trying to say is, when you sit down and you talk to your other peers, as they beat up your idea, you're not your idea. Your, your idea is being put forward for scrutiny. And if you can't have the wherewithal to have somebody challenge the idea, not because they're challenging you as a person, but because they're trying to say, that could be a great idea. Let's beat it up so that it, it becomes as perfect as it can be, as opposed to let's beat you up because I disagree with you. And that, that's a huge separation. So he's, he's basically, in the book, he's basically saying, as a scientist, every idea you have, no matter how much you love it, you have to submit it to other people. And then you have to be comfortable with people basically criticizing your idea, not because they're criticizing you, but because they're trying to get you to a spot where your idea can be as perfect as it can be. And, and we as people, and it's interesting if you think about your daily life, right? Whether it be, you know, going to the car wash or picking up groceries or talking to a member of your family, it's really amazing how often we are married to an idea. And when someone challenges the idea, like you mentioned earlier, Will, you just pick up the racket because you say, oh, you just, you just said I'm wrong. You're challenging me as opposed to you're challenging this idea. And in communication, in particular, when someone's having an issue during a transaction as complex and as life-changing as buying or selling a home, if you go in with a set of ideas that you're not willing to listen to new information on, or you're not willing to lay on the table and have the idea separate from your personal ideology or your personal thoughts on how something should go, that is what creates the conflict, right? And so allowing somebody to say, I'm not so sure an open house is the best idea. And you're going, I've been doing this for 25 years. You better believe open house is the best idea. Now let me use these communication techniques to get you to my side. Now you're already in a calm down of situation. As mm -hmm. opposed to, all right, well, let me look at that idea. Are open houses important? And being willing to accept new information. And that's how you refine and you develop your own ability uh, to communicate in an incredible form. I love it, Joe. I, I like I how you it. Well. <laughs> uh, That's great. Um, yeah, and I, pre I really do appreciate that perspective. Um, I think confident people like collaboration and uh, confident people like questions. 
uh, unconfident people will not ask questions because they're afraid of what the answer, they don't know the answer, so they don't ask questions. So they make a lot of statements and it's very dangerous and, and it sends the wrong message. Okay, so, you know, this idea that there's another perspective, we should, we should recognize it. Um, you know, I was, I often told you guys about my, I, I shadowed my dad in the emergency room a lot when I was a teenager. And I was really impressed with how every single time he had a patient, he just listened so well. And he really cared um, about the patient, e even though, you know, a lot of the patients we saw, I remember that day had like flu-like symptoms. You know, it's like you got the flu. I, I guess he could have just walked in and said, look, I'm, I'm in a hurry. And, you know, you have the flu and moved on. Um, but he didn't, you know, he already knew they had they probably had a flu and there's not a lot, as you guys know, it's not like we do with the flu. I mean, you're not going to, there's nothing you're going to really treat unless it gets severe. And I know, you know, it's gone through COVID as a, as a, as a virus, you know, but with viruses, it's tough, but we saw a lot of people with viruses in the, in the, in the ER. And there's not a lot you're going to do about that. And, uh, but you can be compassionate. You can be understanding. You can listen, you can acknowledge, you can advance the concern. You, you can really see the world from their point of view. And when you do that, it's impossible to argue because like a tennis match, it's like, what if the other player jumped on the same side of the court? It's not possible to have an argument because you can't volley. You, you're going to hit the ball and it never comes back to you. And I think that's a great way to win an argument. <laughs> you want to win an argument? Don't volley. Don't volley. Go on the other side of the, of the, of the court and see it from their same point of view, okay? Go down to the middle of the page of 124. Let's answer this question. Studies have shown that there are uh, some very real elements found in those people that, uh, that we like. People like people that are like blank or they want to be. What is that? What's the blank? Put it in the chat. People like people that are like Yes, Brad, you're right, themselves, okay? So they like people that are like themselves. This is why in the beginning of presentations, we often wanna find connection and commonality, you, you know? Like, like starting off this coaching session, I probably could have said, hey, how was Memorial Day weekend? Where did everyone go? Did anyone go boating, <laughs> you know? Did anyone get some sun? Who went for a hike? You know, did anyone go fishing? Who was with family? We would have find a commonality and a connection and we could have talked about that. That's a great way to build, you know, like I'm like you, okay? So I, I can see the world from your, you know, I'm similar to you. I see the world like you see it, okay? Um, I don't wanna run out of time. So can we go over to where it says, welcome to the age of information? So I wanted to separate out something I think is really, really important, okay? Um, let me find out where is the, all right. So the whole gist on page 125 is we have tons of information. We have, we have literally, there's so much information. How do you make sense of it? And that is the problem. So I'm taking you through paragraph one there, the age of information. Just think about the library on the internet that is, it's so vast, it, it's mind boggling. You, you know, like I, if I wanted to learn how to do something, like I bought an electric trimmer, okay? I bought an electric trimmer, I went to go trim the grass. I pushed the button and all the twine went right into the, into the machine, it disappeared. And what was supposed to be really easy, I found myself going, are you kidding me? So I went to YouTube and I typed in, you know, go motor electric trimmer and I have a two minute video of how to get the string back out, right? I could do anything. Like I could, you know, I, I can learn something. I, I, got, I could talk about speech. I love to watch TED Talks on speech and teaching and I can have the greatest minds on the planet. Endless data, okay? Look at our paperwork and how we've gone from forms and forms and forms and forms. Forms in which I call cookies. Why do I call them cookies? It's because it's an affirmation that I like forms. Because if, if I don't like forms, I won't learn them and I won't be good at them. So I call them cookies, <laughs> okay? Cookies in the oven is a form being baked that's gonna be out soon and I find a way to embrace it. 
but think about rules and laws and all this market data and what the COVID effect and everything that's going on. Okay, and we talk a lot about uh, stats. <clears throat> I'm, I'm likely to talk about this uh, next week in sales meeting, by the way. So go to page 126. So data, data is not information. Information is not knowledge. Um, so I've, if you get what, hey, Angie, what do I always say about, uh, what, fill in the, so, so do the quote for me, all right? It's knowledge is nice. What, what follows that? Anyone know? What do I always say? Knowledge is nice, but, and yes, I do want to but in this case, I do want to delete the first sentence. Knowledge is nice. Wow, Kristen. Oh my gosh, she got it. Yes, but wisdom is why it matters. So the physician level professional knows why. They make sense of data. And if you're talking about a lot of data with clients and not making sense of it, you're not talking like the physician, you're talking like the medical tech. And if you've ever been to the hospital lately and had a test run or for anything, you know the medical tech can only tell you what the numbers are, but will not tell you why it matters, if you're healthy, what you can do, what it means. You go, well, what does that mean? And they go, well, you have to wait for the doctor, right? So what is all this data that we talk about? Every sales meeting, we're talking about data, 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 okay? Just, it's everywhere. Watch how Steve Roney makes sense of it, okay? He is master Jedi. I'm telling you, this guy has a very simple, easy way of communicating why it matters. You'll hear him say things, and by the way, I'm gonna gotta pull it out of him because I'm gonna interview him and get all his, this is what I'm gonna do for sales meeting next week, okay? I gotta pull it out of him, Joe. Um, I gotta pull it out of him. So here, but, but he'll say things like, it's a little bit of a yellow flag. And we're like, oh, we all know what a yellow flag is. It's like caution, warning, could be, but isn't, you know? Like, he'll say things like that. He'll say things like, well, the tide's raising all boats here. You know? Then we all know what that means. So it's across the market. Like, just watch how he does that, okay? And I'm going to dive deeper into this next week. But knowledge is nice and wisdom is why it matters. If you're not talking about why the data matters, you're not communicating on a better plateau in a better way, not the Brookshire way, okay? You're going to have to practice it a little bit. You got to understand why the data matters. You got to translate it for people, okay? You got to translate well, it. On that, just a tiny, it's why it matters to your client. Yes, not to you. <laughs> so, so and, you know, again, we, that's, that's important, right? Because you, you can use statistics to beat somebody else up to try to pull them to your side of the argument, right? And you can could, you could hammer on those things and say, this is why that matters. But if you don't know why it matters to them, you're still in, uh, you have a chasm. You still have a gap between the two. <laughs> hey, le le look at Leslie's comment. Okay, all I did is glance at that and I saw you colon and butt and I'm like, what the heck are we talking about here? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm like, can I even read this? <laughs> but it, it's a it's a good it's a good point, Leslie. It's a good point, and thanks for the humor. <laughs> okay, um, hey, go on the bottom of page 126. Do you see that graph? Joe, don't answer this. Angie, don't answer this. But do you guys have any idea what that graph of data is? Do, do you remember? Okay, look at it. So it peaks It peaks uh, right after Valentine's Day. Okay, it drops. So it peaks at Valentine's then drops. And then it peaks uh, about November. And it looks like about 1st of December. It, and then it drops down. So you guys want to know what that is? Okay, so this is a Facebook study of data. It's not retail sales. <laughs> it, you're, Leslie, you're close. It's relationship status change by Facebook. <laughs> Kim, you got it? Yeah, so apparently, so let's make sense of this. Let's make sense of this data and why it matters, okay? <laughs> apparently, more people change their relationship status right after Valentine's, but before Christmas. Why is that, Joe? Why is that, Kim? It's I don't want to go up Valentine's. 
and I want to clear clear my slate for the New Year's Eve kiss. So we're we're gonna we're gonna get rid of you know anything after Valentine's. <laughs> Valentine's, but the new year, I gotta, I gotta up my game for the new year. <laughs> All right, I like it. I like it. You don't want to be, you don't want to be single on Valentine's Day. So everyone couples up, <laughs> and then you don't want to buy them a Christmas gift. <laughs> so you gotta break up before Christmas, and you gotta be free on New Year's for the kids. All right, so be careful out there. Be careful. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, to Joe's point about why it matters, go on page 127. So we're going to ultimately, I think it's going to come down to this. Okay. Here's these questions. Like if, if data isn't answering these questions, then what good is it? Okay. So is it a good time to buy? Is it a good time to sell? If I'm selling, what are my obstacles? If I'm buying, what are my obstacles? What does the data say that could light my path? And if I understand the reason why it lights the path, then I can communicate it better, right? Not just numbers, but I understand why it matters, okay? Make sense of the numbers and always why it matters, okay? So that's that, those central points there, okay? Um, what do you think uh, in the blanks here? Let's use the chat and then we'll wrap this up. What are we uh, hoping... Um, Mike, Craig, all you guys, uh, Rachel, uh, let's get, you know, our veterans here, get, get engaged on this one. Help me out with this. Let's fill this out. What are we hoping? Don't look at it from data to answer. Let's look at it from what do we want data answer? Okay. So what do we hope that data will tell us about the market conditions we're in right now? There's been some obvious ones. I'm not going to tell you all the answers right now. You tell me. Okay. So, so think about this. What are people saying to us? And then, then we go find the data to, to answer it. So I'm asking you, what are they asking? What are they hoping to know that we can go get data to support, you know, an answer on this? What are they coming to us for? Hit me in the, uh, yes, Wendy, you got it. Top answer on the board. If we're playing family feud, Wendy wins number one answer. Is it a bubble, right? So, right, you know, ultimately it will come to this. You could write that. Is it a bubble? Is this, is the, is it the market a bubble? Okay. What else we got? So, so we go, now, now look, we went through this. We went through about answering the bubble, but I'm not going to go into the data. Let's talk about, you know, will the inventory get better? So is more inventory coming? Okay. So, so there's a great one. You, you know, will low inventory improve? So low inventory improve. Okay, so not, not answering about where we go to get the data, but what are they asking us? Okay, well, prices come down. So we're talking about, you know, this is from a buyer's point of view. Are prices going to continue to appreciate? From a seller, are they coming down? What else? I think Jill nailed it. I mean, on a like buyer's side, much? Worried they're going to pay too much. Am I paying too much? Yeah. And that's why they're asking about the appreciation, right? Because if it's going to continue to appreciate, then we get that, you know, maybe I'm not paying too much, but that's, that's akin to it. What else? Um, okay. What about rates? Because rates have to do with affordability. What else? Well, what I have to offer to win? Uh, well, I don't, I'm not sure how much data is going to light our path on that one, but that's certainly the question they're asking. Come on, guys, what else? There's no wrong answer here. Just tell me what you're hearing from buyers and sellers. What are they asking us that we might be able to go find data to support it? Okay, so what? So areas that are that are holding value maybe above and beyond others. Uh, Kira, is Kira still on or did she drop off? Kira, what are you hearing? What are, what are people asking you? Yeah, should I wait till next year to buy? Uh, okay, yeah, should I wait? Should I, I have a seller right now that, you know, wants to up their price and wants to make sure that they're going to get multiple offers and 
you know, it's just what they hear in the neighborhood. And I don't know, I think it's, they're asking all those questions like, well, am I gonna get all, multiple offers at this price or what's gonna happen? Yeah, so from a yeah. seller's point of view, I mean, they really, they're asking us, how do I net the most, you know, and how do I get the most and judging on what I'm hearing, you know, you know, I, I'm really going to get greedy because now's the chance for this seller to get greedy. Can I get greedy? Maybe they're asking that of you guys, you know, is this a time for me to get greedy and, and go for something way, way, way and above? I mean, I hear people going over list. Can that be me? And how far above list can I go? Now, I think data can help us a lot with that question, you, you know, so uh, you know, can I, uh, you know, over list, I'm just going to write that down over list. I'm going to share these in sales meeting, by the way, guys, over list, uh, you know, greedy. Okay. What else? A couple more and then we'll call it, call it a day. Should I hold on to my money or wait to sweep in and buy when the market crashes? <laughs> okay. So, uh, Cecilia, this is back to, is the market going to crash? And, and, and I know we've gone over this, but there's right. I hope you guys know this. There's no data to support a market crash. There's none. It not, a matter of fact, it's like, it's so good times four. You, you know, I, I mean, we have so much inventory to make up and such a high demand and so many people with good jobs, so many people with cash in their pocket for down payments. It's just nuts, right? So we don't see it coming. Um, yeah, sellers are coming with super high expectations that you have to bring them down in reality a little bit. And certainly data helps with that, you know? Um, okay. All right, guys, let's do this. Give me your takeaways for today. So we, we've been on for an hour. Tell me what is it that you got most out of this? Just one thing that you're going to take away from this and remember throughout the day and throughout the week or something that you want to emphasize. We covered, my goodness, we covered what, four pages, five pages. Uh, what's your takeaway today? What's the, what's the one thing that you got most out of this? Go ahead. Uh, why it will matter. Why, okay, why will, will matter, uh, say, uh, bubble burst, um, let's, trust is built over time, good, be a good listener, listen, acknowledge emotion, um, validate their emotions, love people unconditionally, good, uh, be on their side, good, uh, you never get anywhere with trying to prove someone is wrong, very good, uh, I like all those, don't, don't volley, yeah, don't volley, um, yeah, anyone ever been right, uh, but still been wrong? <laughs> if you're in a relationship, I know you've been right and still been wrong, okay? Uh, and I think that kind of makes the point, doesn't it? Because you still ended up losing. It's, you didn't get what you wanted, did you? You remember the saying, if you have to choose between being right or being kind, always pick kind, right? If you have to be, if you have to choose between being right or kind, always choose being kind. All right. Well, I sure love you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of you all. Um, sincerely, I brag about you all the time and feel very fortunate to be associated with you all. Uh, impressive what this group of agents uh, are able to do. So uh, let's go out there and be better communicators. You know, let's do that because it's a, it's a task. It's, it's a skill set and, and a task that's worthy of our, our improvement and sharpening our saw. And the book of the day is uh, Win Friends and Influence People. So if you don't have that one or you do have it, uh, dust it off and go through it again. I think you'll be, uh, you'll be enlightened uh, on something that you need, okay? All right, guys, have a wonderful day. We're gonna sign off. Appreciate everyone who had something to contribute. It makes the class great. I really appreciate it, okay? Have a great day. Thanks, you guys. Bye-bye.